to our modern treaty nations and talking about some of those on the ground experiences and looking for some tips and tricks from those who have been through that that process already. So thank you to Kim and Valerie and and uh, Grace for joining us today and we'll be sharing that uh, afterwards. And then of course going into our modern treaty nations and talking about some of those on the ground experiences and looking for some tips and tricks from those who have been through that that process already. So thank you to Kim and Valerie and and uh, Grace for joining us today and we'll be sharing that uh, afterwards. Uh, so thanks again to all of you for joining. Um, I have arbitrarily <clears throat> assigned my friends their speaking order <laughs> and uh, um, I'd like to really welcome the next three panel members. Uh, Kim Baird, former chief of Tawasin First Nation and currently serving as their acting CAO as I understand. Um, Kim does many, many, many things uh, in her career and has done many things. I'm honoured to have known her over these years and really looking forward to hearing her story. Um, alongside uh, colleague Valerie, another friend of mine, Chemquat from Tawasin First Nation as well, currently serving as one of the elected council members and also doing many, many things in her career. And um, <clears throat> these are people who were there for Mono. They were one step ahead of us in our ratification and and. Uh, treaty process coming up to our effective date. So we all became fast family and friends and leaned on each other and supported each other and shared information. And I'm always glad to see that that uh, tradition moving forward. Um, also, Grace Adams. Um, Grace from Tlaaman First Nation will also be joining this panel uh, to talk about some of their experiences. Grace was extremely involved in the Tlaaman process throughout, um, as many of us were probably from day one right until uh, and following effective date of the treaty and continues to work with Tlaaman First Nation. So tremendous amount of that corporate history that uh, Ashley and Coral were talking about in their presentations as well among this entire panel. So I can't thank you all enough uh, for joining us today. Day and your willingness to share your stories and some of your experiences with us. This will only be scratching the surface, I'm sure, but uh, as with the other presenters from today, we, we welcome you and thank you so much for agreeing to share your time with us today. So our presentation order today will be Kim, Valerie, and Grace. So over to you, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you can see on the screen, my ancestral name is Quintil Tanat. That comes from my great, great great-grandfather Quintilum from Tuwassen. I am uh, the former chief of Tuwassen First Nation and chief negotiator. I uh, did both at the same time. <clears throat> Currently, I'm the chancellor for Kwantlen Polytechnic University and the uh, interim chief administrative officer for Tuwassen First Nation. And I do consulting and uh, board work. So never a dull moment for me. Um, I have, am the proud mom of three daughters. Uh, they're known as the treaty babies because they came along at different treaty milestones. So uh, often the treaty work had uh, me lugging a baby around and my team helping uh, with all that. And uh, half the time staff would run into my office to grab one of my babies. They wouldn't even say hi to me and, and uh, they're more interested in spending time with one of my daughters often because uh, I was, uh, Taskmaster, as uh, Val will attest to a, a little bit later. But uh, what's interesting about that is our treaty is three weeks older than my youngest daughter, who's 14. So it's a pretty uh, good reminder about the progress of our self-governance journey and remembering it's still very young and still an adolescent uh, in its age. Um, I'm zooming in from Tuasin Treaty Territory today. Really like to thank uh, the BC Treaty Commission for inviting me to be here. I'm not sure how much I can add uh, based on everything we've heard so far. And I agree with Val's comments that, you know, uh, the ones that come after us have a much better uh, opportunity to do things better than we did. Uh, really impressive. And, you know, hindsight's 2020 and all that. But I'll uh, put my thoughts, I'll, I'll give you a few of my thoughts about how your st strategic approach impacts the process and tactics you select. Uh, as former chief and chief negotiator, although I oversaw a lot of the uh, tactics, uh, Val definitely was further in the trenches than me and all that. So she's gonna speak to that in a bit more uh, detail. Both Val and I are from Tawasin. Uh, and I would also say that our ratification took place 15 years ago 
So forgive me for any memory lapses, which I do have, not may have. Uh, I'll give you a, just a snapshot of our, our circumstances 15 years ago. We were a single First Nation voting on our treaty and constitution at the same time. Our population was around 400, I think, give or take. Val might have more info on that. But I uh, just wanted to give you a sense of the order of magnitude about our people. About half our members lived on the former reserve and half lived all over the place. But we have strong concentrations of people in the Okanagan and Washington state in the US. So this also was a time right before social media became so prevalent. So uh, that provided us some different older school opportunities uh, and constraints, I would say, for engagement. I wanna say that your approach to eligibility really impacts the type of outreach you will need to do. Um, and in our case, our eligibility requirements are quite inclusive. So if you have Tawasan ancestry through two generations, you are more or less eligible to be a Tawasan member. And due to colonization, our people are everywhere, some with membership, some without. And strategically thinking that all these people were uh, had um, birth rights to Tawasan rights and title um, was one thing, but also to think about the amazing opportunities that we had talented, diverse, and skilled Tawasan people out all over the place with so much to bring back home versus the other view was feeling threatened because some of our members felt they were outsiders because they didn't live on reserve. So that, that whole kind of um, dynamic is something you have to think through. And both are true, both are valid. So uh, it's a part of important community discussions, I think. I, in my heart of hearts, believe we are nations and that our people can be anywhere in the world and still have rights and responsibilities as a Tawasan person. And in our experience, reconnecting was a very powerful community building and healing process. It didn't fix some of the disruptions of uh, colonization, obviously, but it was a powerful reclamation process that allowed families to reconnect with each other and for people to reclaim their Tawasan identity and for Tawasan to reclaim their people. So every nation has its own path on these criteria, and I don't think it's a right or wrong thing, but it does really impact the approach we needed to have um, because we had to do significant outreach based on our approach. And I really believe this approach can't work without the uh, TLC that our team provided. And resourcing your team is important, especially if you have capacity limitations like Tawasan did. We had to worry about not only our e, &E committee, which is internal, but we had to also worry about ratification ensure our engagement capacity was increased for that engagement push to the ratification and all with limited numbers of people to recruit. Uh, so you have to really think through your whole team strategically when you think about this. But in our case, we had a uh, very detailed minded women who uh, were very, very passionate about um, tracking down people, but also documenting it and making sure that people had their voice in the Tawasan Treaty. So uh, our team, I can't stress how encouraging people were to get people to enroll. Um, and Val will talk about some of the amazing lengths our team went through uh, to connect with people, to help them do what they needed to do as far as paperwork, identification, all those things to ensure that they could participate in making the most important decision our nation has had to make, at least in, in living memory. So we selected organized uh, and detailed focused collaborative people who are extremely creative to make people feel comfortable enrolling. And I really think some magic happened when all these connections reformed. So, Again, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the hindsight uh, component of this and hearing uh, people speak earlier. And Coral spoke about the technical nature of the enrollment process. We had push pushback on this and also because of confusion about why do you need to enroll? 
So I'll spend a minute on this because uh, had we known we would have faced that encounter, we would have been much more proactive like Comox appears to have been on this, this matter. And I'm very interested to hear the evolving issues today because it is also interesting to think about the confusion enrollment caused on um, ratification issues and how people would link the two. So I would say that uh, firstly, when I heard concerns about from our members, why do we need to enroll to be a Twasson beneficiary? We're all already a top Twasson member. Some people were concerned that their non-participation would take their identity away as Twasson members and they were feeling coerced. I also heard, heard based on ratification rules um, as it pertained to eligible voters versus enrolled voters, that enrollment turned into a screen of sorts, that the more people that weren't enrolled means the more people can't vote, which means that is it's essentially a negative vote. Um, and some in some communities, people were targeted, sorry, targeted if they enrolled. They were singled out to ask why they were enrolling and did that mean they were supporting the treaty? So in my experience, safe and private voting is integral to the ratification and it's fully linked to the enrollment process when you think about these factors. In relation to issues around community concerns around enrollment, I think it was uh, really important to spend time with TWAS members on this issue. And it was communicated that a ratification couldn't happen without enrollment because the enrollment ensured people were the eligible beneficiary for the treaty benefits. We also communicated that Tuasa members should actively participate on approving or defeating a ratification because it was their rights that were involved, so it couldn't be a passive process. Um, we also set an internal goal that had 60% participation and 60% approval for it to pass. Uh, I'm not sure what would have happened had we not reached it with because the treaty said otherwise, that it's a lower threshold than that. Turned out okay because in the end we had over 90% participation and a 70% positive vote. And I know this is an eligibility and enrollment discussion, but as I stated, they are strategically linked and setting a higher threshold relieved a lot of concerns about the legitimacy of the vote. I would say now, 15 years after our vote, we've had to rethink some of our eligibility requirements and uh, made some changes and we will continue to review uh, that as we go forward as a nation. We also uh, lost some of our members' contact information because if we don't have um, outreach pushes like we did for the treaty, it's easy to lose track. So now we're re-implementing some of those practices to ensure we stay connected. In addition to the members gathering we have annually, where we bring members together once a year to go through our AGM and strategic priorities, et cetera, our members are still very mobile. So it's important to keep updating our records um, and uh, to keep track of where our people are, uh, et cetera. But it turns out when you give out money, that's a good tool as well. <laughs> They're uh, more inclined to stay on top of their contact information, making sure we have it. I would also say that understanding that we can provide, uh, what we can provide to members on and off lands and communicating that has become more important than we had first realized. So there are some real service implications about how we take up our jurisdiction so in addition to Ashley's comments about status versus non-status and Canada's recognition of how we uh, de determine our citizenship, there's also geography as a consideration too, especially since we have a good number of members in the US as well. Uh, David gave a really good analysis of Kitsilis demographics and how it helps them deploy their engagement with Kitsilis people, but it's really important to think all of these things through and manage expectations when the road ahead is often unclear when you're in the final throes of negotiations. Uh, it's There's an art to it for sure. So uh, I'm gonna wrap up there and just thank you for letting me spend a few moments from a high level perspective talking about the issue because in my opinion, the tone set from the top is really important to the work. 
And it was one of those scenarios where the journey was more important than the destination. And I had no idea how important this outreach was to nation building, in, in my opinion, anyways. So with that, thank you. And I'll hand it over to Val. Thanks, Kim. And thank you. Uh, Kim, just want to extend thanks for your presentation and <laughs> just commenting that, yeah, how much you forget as time goes on, I think is a real um, valuable thing to keep in our minds because when I'm tell talking to about our story to other communities too, you know, you, you say you're going through this and you always think you're doing the most difficult thing. Negotiations is the most difficult thing. And as you carry on, you realize that you did that and it wasn't as hard as you thought. And now the thing you're working on is the most difficult thing. So, you know, the, the, the scope of work as you move forward into self-government just continues to grow and expand. And we're really proving that we can step up to this, the plate and take this on because we we are getting it done. So really appreciate that, Kim. Thanks. I just want to say thank you, Heichka, Kim. As usual, you know, you going first uh, in uh, being, you know, playing the, the leadership role um, makes a big difference on, on the work that I do. Hang on a second here. And uh, um as guiding our work in all the ways that we we do uh, the things that we do. Um, so I think Val is getting set up to share some slides. Okay, Valerie Tanasqui Talitsin Ak Tawasin. My name is Valerie, and um, I'm from Tawasin First Nation. My ancestral name is Chemquat. Uh, it is uh, a Squamish name that I carry from my grandmother Pearl's side of the family. Uh, Grandma Pearl was raised on the Mission Reserve, and she. Um, her mother, uh, Helen Perkins, and her mother, Chemquat. My grandfather, Isaac Williams, his mother was Elizabeth Point, and uh, her brothers, uh, James and John Point, connect me to the, Squ uh, the Musqueam na Nation. I am a proud Tawasin uh, member, and I've been working with Tawasin, as uh, Chief Kim had alluded to, uh, for the last uh, big integral parts of, of the Tawasin negotiation. Uh, some of my role in addition to administration uh, was enrollment. And so I'm going to share a little bit about the experiences that I had uh, with the enrollment team. Uh, I was listening to the previous panels and I want to echo and uh, I was listening to the other panels and it was so good to hear uh, the, the work that they did and how they built on the experience that we shared. Such impressive work. Um, what I want to share is quickly is our enrollment team, uh, and I'm going to be echoing a little bit and building on what Kim had already shared. We picked people who knew our families and who knew our members. They were members of the community or they Tawasa members themselves. Uh, they were friendly. They were uh, they had they were un, they had no sort of polit political biases. They were very much like Switzerland type of people. So people felt welcoming to to have them come into their homes or talk to them at meetings. Um, and we made sure that our team members were accessible. Um, the we it took a little bit to find the team members to meet the administrative challenges. And Comox has really shared about how they're addressing that by making sure that they're their coordinators and their committee members um, are having the training that they need. We also placed a big focus on customer service for the committee as well, making sure that we were there to serve the members in any way or shape or form that we could. Um, the enrollment team, because they were so intimate with the members that had enrolled, uh, did become the ratification team. And that streamlined that process as Kim had alluded to. Um, I myself have been on the enrollment committee since its inception, and uh, we've had two other members that have been longtime members and have been there for many years, and that builds that corporate knowledge, that continuity. Uh, so the, the clerk role wasn't an easy role to fill. They needed high organization skills, they needed high customer service excellence, they needed research skills, and they needed strong knowledge to our families and our ancestors. Part of the enrollment as job, as Kim mentioned, was to encourage enrollment. So because our uh, the committee members knew the families, they could reach out. Uh, because staff was also connected to the community and was friendly, they could reach out. Uh, we made our face members feel safe and comfortable and also sort of address some of the uncomfortable feelings they were feeling about the application enrollment themselves. Um, we uh, purchased portable equipment so that we could be at every single function that Tawasin was having. We would set up a table at the back. It wasn't about what was being discussed, but we would set up a table at the back and we would um, 
just quietly be there for people that haven't been able to enroll. We'd have the printer. We created special breakfast events that would bring the community together. And then we would have our table there on the side. Um, we would go down to Bellingham to meet our Washington um, contingent of members. And we would sit in the buffet area and we would second the corner of the area, set up our printers there, set up our computers there. And families would come in, they would eat and we would go pay. I would go up to the front and say, I'm paying for 15 buffets, please. And I just was up there all the time paying for them. We as staff had to eat there three times a day because we couldn't just be there and not eat. Um, but it, not only did we achieve the job that we, we needed to do of getting the enrollments, we brought family together and they were having fun and we were being connected. And we also brought back other issues uh, to staff and treaty team and council that might have been on those members' minds at the time. Um, we also set enrollment goals. As Kim had mentioned, we had thresholds that we needed to meet. And so uh, we set monthly goals that we had to meet using a thermostat in our, our staff office. And we recorded that because rather than saying, oh, we had to have, you know, X amount of members enrolled in order for the ratification, that we were panicking that we needed to get, you know, 80% of the population enrolled, we'd already had met, uh, we're continually building on that. So when it came close to ratification, we still panicked a bit because, you know, getting those last you know, you know, you want to make sure that you have over the need that you need uh, the number of uh, members enrolled in the treaty to vote um, as you needed, uh, instead of just making it in case anybody. Uh, yeah, so it, it was uh, it was the goals that we used to help uh, motivate ourselves and create the events. Um, the treaty team created this calendar that they published uh, to the the, uh, the nation with planned activities. And where I've got the the red circles on the on this presentation, assuming you can still see my presentation, um, we went to off reserve meetings. We went to the tax workshop. We went to the treaty information fair. We went to the annual general meeting. We went to youth workshops. We push it, positioned ourselves in any place that we possibly could in order to encourage enrollment. Um, we also, before I move on to the next one, we created custom postcards that people knew that these were the enrollment postcards. Uh, we made sure that the envelopes that we we uh, sent out had uh, printed on their enrollment information or time sensitive information so that when people receive things in their mailbox, it wasn't just another bill, it was something that was unique and then it stood out. Um, we created, we uh, piggybacked on some of the bulletins that we were had um, created through the treaty team as well. Uh, some of the challenges that we we faced, oh, I forgot, we also created uh, works, gene genealogy workshops as well. We also went to hospitals when newborns were born and enrolled their parents there. We went to pubs where the youth were, the young adults were meeting and, and met with them and bought them burgers. Um, we uh, went, rented banquet rooms at hotels in the key spaces in, in key areas like Vernon or in Bellingham. And we stayed there all day long. Uh, and we, we had fixed, uh, fixed meals. And again, families would come in. And then sometimes they piggyback with uh, treaty uh, updates. And other times we were just there to not just support enrollment, but we also supported status card needs as well. We phoned people, we used a lot of phoning uh, to connect with people. We used the matriarchs of the families to help us uh, wrangle all the members to come to, to gatherings. As Kim mentioned, social media was not prevalent as much as prevalent as it was at the time uh, then. So some of the challenges was back, so first one challenge was, does enrollment have two L's or one? So we all had, we had to settle on that as a, as a team. What did we want to use to publish that? Second one was we had to create everything by scratch, we had NISCA as a, as one model, but we had to do a lot of research and a lot of revisions to find out what kind of forms we wanted. How did we want to have the application? What was meeting the uh, uh, the, the requirements in the enrollment chapter? And then answering the questions: Why do I have to enroll? Um, you know, and 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 Kim started said said some things about that as well, and. And so we we tried to make sure that they, we provided simple messages on why members had to enroll. And one of them was, you have a voice, you need to use it, whether you approve, agree with the treaty or not, that's your right to make that choice, but you need to enroll to vote to do that. Um, another re other reasons we, we shared in other publications to, you have to enroll if you wanna receive benefits under the treaty, if you want to be a landowner, you have to be enrolled, and so on and so on. Um, 
there was a deep, then all of a sudden we had one member that enrolled and decided at the last minute that, that that individual did not want to be enrolled in the treaty and had to unenroll. Well, we didn't have any kind of procedures for that. For, so we're dealing with unenrollment. And that was something that we shared with the nations like Comox and other nations that asked us, Ram, and what, what things do you need to prepare, prepare for that? And then also to prepare for how often people can unenroll because otherwise unenroll, enroll, unenroll, unenroll. And so we had to get legal help with that. We had to figure out. Um, so we 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 came upon the final decision that you can unenroll once and then you can re-enroll again. So uh, we've got that. Uh, we made it very clear when people unenrolled what that meant. Uh, since then, uh, just as a piece of uh, update information, that person that unenrolled has since rolled in, enrolled back into the treaty. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't had anybody unenrolled since then. We had to, the, some of the challenges we're dealing with the myths and uh, some of my um, the other panelists have spoken about that. You know, the real big confusion about I don't want to lose my status. So putting out publications about what that means, what status, what status means and, and being a treaty member means. Um, there was a lot of information for members to learn and understand. And uh, we tried to narrow our focus to be on enrollment because it was the rest of the treaties team to, to deal with that. But we piggyback uh, with them on, um, on maximizing that information. Tracking information, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the importance of data management for this. Um, Excel spreadsheet was the first thing that we had, and it was something that the, the province had helped us create this database to track, and we piggybacked that database with the ratification database as well. Um, then we had to, went to the effort of selecting an actual membership database we had been using. Um, uh, so we used the Excel spreadsheet, we used a little bit of Zintax because that had, what had already had most of our members in there. We did some more research, and we end up selling on uh, a database called Aboriginal Information Systems, and we still use that today. Although I think the enrollment committee is considering that we may need another tool to manage. Our membership has uh, gone from, I think it was 350, Kim, when we were doing that, we are now over 500. Um, with half of those people are now eligible voters. Um, and there's all kinds of information to track. Uh, the membership database became the hub for checking for who was eligible and enrolled for uh, minors trust, for elders distribution, land ownership. All the departments would come to the enrollment clerk uh, for the enrollment database to ver verify that, that, that an individual um, was in fact enrolled to, re enrolled to receive treaty be benefits. We had to make sure that we had our staff train. Uh, the, the, the differentiation between managing our status cards and our enrollment database how do we, we don't need to want to manage that separately because that's a lot of work. How do we manage the, 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 the information has to be kept separately, but there's uh, records management that, uh, that helps uh, both causes. Um, there was information that the membership wanted about um, enrollment, who's being enrolled, you know, all of the, the challenges that Kim alluded to about you know, the, 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 the changes in the distinctions of some of our members. So removing names from it, we started publishing enrollment statistics and we just keep building on that. And that way we are being as transparent as we can about numbers and not individuals uh, for our members. Uh, records management became uh, more and more important and the role of the records clerk became more than just an I, uh, um, uh, Indian status registry administrator. Uh, it became more about doing the records management, the um, identification uh, services uh, when people had needed IDs, um, status cards, uh, helping with genealogy. Um, and so uh, the records uh, clerk, the, the enrollment clerk, records clerk, became an integral role in our, our offices. Another thing that, uh, that um, that Kim also mentioned uh, was our members eligibility. In 2011, it became clear that we had many distinctions for members benefit members who were enrolled in treaty. Uh, we had new categories that created a lot of confusion. What, what do I have access to? Um, what do status members on lands have? Status member off lands, non-status members on lands, non-setters off lands. And all of a sudden we have this distinction um, uh, membership. And so uh, we created some, we did a lot of work and we created some publication to share with our members. It's something that we're still working with. Um, but I wanna add 
that our revenue that we've generated and our ability to be self-governed has given us the tools and funds to bridge the gaps for the, some of those member distinctions and make them make them uh, less important uh, so that our members can be treated with equity um, and fairness. And uh, so that is actually, for me, that's one of the bigger tools. I'll use an example um, of how the membership enrollment um, and our self-government and our treaty have allowed us to bridge those gaps. We have members now that live in the U.S. that are now eligible for post-secondary funding because of the funds that we provide, not because of, of the treaty. The treaty just gave us the tools to make our own laws and make our own programs and do serve our members as we see fit. Um, so here, I'm just going to rush forward to 2023. Um, again, uh, as, a, as a good leader does, Kim set the path forward. Our engagement role for the Enrollment Committee is a little bit different now. It's about accurate information. It's about making sure that new babies get enrolled. It's about um, receiving new applications from relatives that have been long lost and, and, and may not have um, uh, been connected to our nation and uh, helping them uh, understand uh, where their ancestry goes, uh, where their ancestry is connected to. We're not as active in the community as we used to be, but we are working to change that. And I think that the um, the 15 year review of the treaty, um, this this council, as well as the voice of, the, of our members have been asking for us to be more connected. So our presence is smaller right now, but I think we're working to increase that presence. Um, we pop, we, uh, with the effort to remain transparent, we publish a quarterly report to share with the members again statistics um, and encourage them to give us their current information. When we used to have ha give out checks for um, for distributions and things like that, people would come in and we would we would then set up making sure that everybody had their current address. But with direct deposit, um, it's a little harder to uh, get that information. So we're working on always keeping that data that data current. I think that's it. Um, it's been an amazing journey and, and it really is. I was reflecting with Kim that, you know, 15 years in, I've been in this involved in this enrollment um, business for a long time and uh, and we've grown and we've learned, but it's time for us to evolve again. We're not the same nation that we were, and we don't have the same purpose for enrollment that we did when we started out. And it's a really good opportunity for us now to really take a look. Um, our enrollment committee does not have a lot of discretion when it comes to um, approving applications. It's pretty set out in our, our laws, who's eligible, who's not. Um, uh, uh, we, we've got more policies that work that we need to do, but I think that it's time for that collaboration to see what's the next evolution of this, this, this committee and um, how can we do better to serve our members and how this committee can, this can, uh, committee can help um, the members and leadership uh, do their work to make sure that members who are enrolled in the tree and eligible for benefits are, um, are in our records and are managed and our committee is still continuing to support that outreach. Uh, hi Sapka, hi Chika, thank you for listening. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Valerie, and Kim as well for sharing that uh, to Austin's story. Um, yeah, I, I just really struck from your very first words of saying, you know, putting the right team in place. And um, I'm probably one of those Switzerlands in my community. So I totally understand what you're getting at is that you need people there who who people just feel trusted with, people without an agenda. And it's really important to get this work done. And again, as as Ashley and Coral talked about before, it's really that that base of building capacity and bringing your people in to be able to do that important work beyond. And really appreciate um, you linking that to the ongoing work as well. And the fact that the Enrollment Committee continues and how that looks as you go forward, I think was a really uh, great insight as well. Um, I'd like to to move to Grace, uh, friend Grace Adams from Tlaaman, who I've worked with for a number of years as well, and who's been involved since day one in this journey. So without further ado, Grace, I'll allow you to introduce yourself and to share a bit of the Tlaaman story with us. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Grace Adams, and I'm a member of Tlaaman, and um, I've uh, been involved. Oh, I have one son. He's uh, 27 and living in Victoria, so thank you to the um, some I see Song He's here, you know. My my son lives in your traditional territory, and yeah, um, you look you look after him very well. And I appreciate it. Uh, our journey is a little different, um, but definitely uh, we had some hiccups along the way because uh, initially the um, E and E file went down to the nation, um, 
and um, I'll back up a bit, um, Slime and Treaty Society was mandated to do negotiations. So we were separate from the, from the nation. And initially the e, &E funding went um, down to the band office and uh, they had a lot of hiccups. Um, it wasn't managed, um, you know, as efficiently um, as it should have been. So it got transferred to our office. And uh, so around 2008, it got transferred. Um, in hindsight, I think some of the lessons learned is I don't think we would have voted as often as, often as we um, did. So for example, in 2001, we voted on our AIP um, and that vote was 51%. No, 49%, yes. We went to the polls again in 2006 um, on a, a AIP again, and that was um, a yes vote. Uh, we went to the polls because we, for the constitution in 2009, and that was um, with those who were enrolled. So you had to be enrolled to vote and that passed. And uh, so I, in hindsight would, you know, we shouldn't have voted so many times on the AIP because I think it set the tone you know, around, um, you know, there wasn't enough, the, our, our community didn't have enough time to really think about what this treaty meant. You know, it didn't have enough time to learn about it, didn't have the communication dollars that you may have at your table. And um, it didn't allow us to build trust. It didn't allow us to work more closely with the nation uh, because the nation was um, going through um a little bit of uh, financial struggles. It was um, in remedial management off and on. It was facing arrears, um, or sorry, it was facing deficits. And so our community had this had this um, lens that maybe we're, we weren't quite ready to manage um, our finances and we weren't ready for self-government. So, um, you know, that partnership with the nation is critical. And it and um and that's across the board. So if you're doing data management, you know, um, then you know that message uh, needs to be you know across the board to departments. Over time, you know, set goals because you know that record and data management is critical. And uh, today, even today, uh, in in some departments, because of that lack of um, depth it's really impacting um how it's uh, carrying out um the ability to give um land and home ownership so so i my message is really around you know the essence i uh, of of data and record management and and gis and i don't know if any of you have gis departments but they're critical in and how you're able to um, manage your data so uh our E, &E um, journey, um, our numbers are a bit bigger, are larger. So when we voted in 2012, we had about a thousand enrolled, or sorry, a thousand population, and about a hundred do not enroll by choice, and or we just didn't know how to uh, locate them. So, uh, so I would say. Um, our, we hit the mark pretty good in terms of our outreach. You know, we wanted to 100% make sure that we uh, contacted every single person on our membership list. And and uh, we had a great team uh, that uh, reached out and social media um, played an impact um, on our ability to reach people, but also played an impact on um, um, false information. But definitely our team um, had a lot of depth around um, outreach. Uh, we were meticulous with um, record keeping. Uh, definitely there were gaps. So after a while we started realizing as you, we analyzed um, how many people were coming to sessions and who wasn't, we saw distinct, uh, a, a, dis, a distinct, um, trail happening, which means certain families were not walking through the door. They just never attended a session, weren't interested in attending a session. And that whole issue around, you know, if I attend a session, does that mean I support treaty? 
So uh, we had to design a different approach and um, family focus groups was one. So if we knew a certain family wasn't attending, then we kind of thought, okay, who's the leader in that family? Can we, can we join them? Um, we uh, put out to them, um, you choose your facilitator. It could be a member of our negotiating team or it could be a member of BC in Canada because the whole neutrality thing was so critical. Uh, one of the areas that I'm not quite sure, one of the population groups that I'm not quite sure how to approach is those who are vulnerable. And uh, what I mean is that we identified some that were living in uh, downtown East Side. And, uh, you know, we went to look for them, but, it, you know, are they in a place to hear you? And, or how do you communicate? Because it's not only about your treaty message, but about how, as a nation, do you uh, contact those who are vulnerable? And, and, and also those, um, maybe even in our own community, those who are vulnerable. So that, I, I don't have a, a solution to, but uh, some of you who live in maybe more urban areas, um, and or even in if, if you live in remote communities, you know how do you approach those who are who are quite vulnerable? And I and um, so that's that's um, we definitely had people, uh, you know, that went to the east side. We we also had uh, liaisons who actually worked part time for us. So we had a Vancouver liaison and a Victoria liaison, and so we had them as um, that were actively out out there, um, you know, reaching out. Um, like Tuasen, and maybe like many of you, we have um, members who are living in the uh, Tacoma area, Seattle. So we we had an outreach team there, and um, it, you, in terms of reconnecting, I, they really appreciated those efforts. And and to today, um, they will actively participate. Um, in general assemblies via um, like a virtual session. And um, it's been a long time since our, our um, nation has been able to host assemblies like in person in Vancouver. But before COVID, they actually traveled. Um, any Seattle, uh, anyone living in the States, the nation would pay for their um, trip, you know, to the urban centers. So uh, that outreach in the States was critical in terms of nation building. I'll jump to today's stats because um, I know um, a lot of you may want to ask questions, but uh, our, um, we'll call them citizenship, our citizenship enrollment um, stopped in 2021 as our citizenship law is being amended. So all, um, and uh, currently, um, our stats are 951 are enrolled, and 222 are not enrolled. In the wait, um, and there are 85 waiting to be enrolled. And most of them are newborns, and or those who have uh, recently gained status. So the third reading for our citizenship law is supposed to take effect um, in September. And hopefully, our um, maybe by October, or we'll have a new citizenship law, and it's going to address the issue. The whole um, it's going to address connectivity, but it's when that's available, I encourage any of you to um, take a look um, at it because it it will um, take it. It's trying to address the issue of costs. I guess you could say, a lot of people now um, want to enroll uh, to gain access to post secondary funds and or dividends. Uh, we're not in a place yet to, like, we can augment our budgets, but not uh, to the extent of being able to um, give everyone um, uh, post-secondary funds. So um, a big integral part of the uh, citizenship clerk's role is the family tree. So the family tree right now is um, being used to um, for anyone that's on hold. So that uh, citizenship clerk is being tasked. Can you can you pull birth certificates, 
uh, marriage certificates, death certificates. Of course, if they have our 554, it's automatic. But for those who don't, there's a lot of research has to be done to determine, you know, how connected are they to our community. Uh, another area that uh, wasn't clear when we were going through our um, e, e process was the privacy concerns. It, uh, I think that that's critical. Um, you know, we we assured assured our members, yes, um, your information is is secure. But I think that um, you know how do how do you demonstrate that? And um, at that time, we didn't have policies in place. But uh, I think that that's really critical because um, you know your ability to go to the to the polls, um, you know, and cast your vote and 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 not be worried about is it a yes or no or people guessing how you're voting. And uh, yeah, so that's a in a nutshell. I I, I do want to say that um, in 2012, may you many of you may or may not know. Um, is that when we went to vote on our final agreement, um, we were blockaded. So that's how um, high the emotions were in our community. Um, there was a lot of distrust, um, a lot of um, high emotion. You know, there there was just the camps had had settled, like the no camp, the yes camp. And so we had to get an injunction. Um, we, we got one, we had like, geez, try to remember how many, 20 police cars came into the community on the, our vote date in July to open our polls just so we can complete our vote. And, um, you know, it, uh, you know, the worst discussion you can ever have, I think, is, is, is injunction talks, um, but we, we did. And um, we opened the polls, and um, again, we we um, got a 51 yes and 49. So we were still split, but the yes vote came through. So, you know, our journey was uh, colorful. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, for your team, for our team, sorry, we really, you have to really soul search and figure, you know, why are you doing this journey? Um, you know, what is the bigger picture? What's your vision for your community? And, um, you know, our neighboring nations, you know, that have treaties like Manoff, Tuas, and Niska, you know, were so um, critical in terms of moral support, in terms of never um, forgetting that um, this is a goal. Um, don't lose sight of the goal. Um, be neutral. Um, you know, uh, don't, um, you know, um, it, it was a challenging time, um, but we got through it. Uh, today, I can say that um, that the the tensions um, in terms of families, in terms of those who are no votes, you know, I can easily they everyone can easily talk to each other. That's behind us. Um, uh, we're thriving. Um, our our finances are incredible. We've um, our you know, achieved our goal of nation building. Um, it, you know, it, it, it was um, life changing in terms of um, for our team who, who really uh, worked long and hard hours and, and it took some punches. Um, but it is what it is. And, um, you know, I'm, I would do it again. Um, I would put more boundaries in place around conflict. And I, and I hope that your community, if, if it's going through conflict, can build its own rules around, hey, you know, I think we've stepped up, we've gone out of bounds here. Let's let's uh, uh, step back and, and not be so um, hurtful or not so uh, mean or not so bullying, you know, um, because we all live here. Um, you know, we all want, we all, we are all related. And it didn't have to be so divisive. So, um, yeah, I think that um, I really want to thank um, for you. Uh, thank you for listening to our story, our journey. And I hope it isn't as contentious as ours was. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Grace, to share uh, that story that <clears throat> can be tough to tell. Um, I, I think that it's so encouraging to hear how you've come through it. And I appreciate uh, the courage that Tlaman continues to take in um, having the conviction that it was the right decision and that you're you're moving forward as a community and have rebuilt your nation and continue to do so. So um, that's very, very encouraging. A um, couple of things really stood out for me um, in terms of I think not only the record keeping, uh, the records management in that, and you talked about what happened when you really analyzed where the gaps were in your community. And I think maybe we've all gone through that, certainly we did um, in our communities, is that we made a lot of assumptions about where our people were, um, what they were doing, and uh, what they were interested in. And when we really sat down and took the time to analyze where it was that people were, it was it was eye opening for us, and it really impacted our strategy and how we move forward and continue to communicate. Um, really uh, the the unifying piece of doing this communications work stands out to me in all the presentations that I've heard this morning. And you talked about the liaisons and including visiting people in the States, how empowering that is for nations. And I think every one of us has got a story about a family, an individual or a group of people who felt like they were alienated and didn't belong to our nation and through direct communications and having a coffee with them and talking to them about how important it is for them to participate in government, how unifying that can become for the nation. That doesn't mean that people come in and it's all rose colored glasses. They come in with, um, you know, with concerns and legitimate concerns, but we found that people address them in a different way. They don't address them just to complain about them. They address them with a view to trying to find solutions. And I find that that's one of the biggest benefits that we've seen uh, coming out of treaty and we continue to do that and, and it's not easy. Mm. Uh, thank you so much, Grace, for, for your presentation oh. to, to Kim and Val. Um, Kim and Val, did you have anything having heard Grace's presentation that you would like to, to add or comment on? I'll just say that, you know, when you do anything on the kind of rights and title front for Indigenous communities, First Nations, I guess, in BC more specifically, that it's like you're kicking a hornet's nest. And if you don't have a plan to finish, it's just going to um, really aggravate everyone with no end in sight. So it's that old expression, if you're going through hell, keep going. And just want to put my hands up to Amen for having the strength and fortitude to keep going in spite of the different challenges you had, and in, including, you know, um, government was away from the table for a while. Uh, and you're trying to get through ratification and acknowledge how difficult that was and how much I admire uh, your team and your leadership for keeping on in spite of those challenges. But I really do think you can't kind of raise any of this, these sorts of initiatives, whether it's in the treaty process or otherwise, casually because our people are just so passionate about their rights and often have limited information about what's going on out there as well so um uh, they may be guided from armchair critics and and the like so it's a, a complex minefield to try and get through i think thanks for that kim uh valerie anything to add well, it's always tough to follow kim you know uh you know but i, I think that uh one thing I just just wanted to add is that yes, it was it was we were we were supporting Clam and uh, with everything that we had for for the journey that they were going through, but I think that the lesson is 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 to be able to provide as much information as possible to you know easily accessible to all members, and I think one thing that I learned from the journey is that we brought our critics in close as well, and we gave them an opportunity to actually. Um, have an opinion that share their opinion and all we asked was that they shared facts and uh and some of our uh, people that were uh, really unsure about the treaty uh ended up joining uh seeing the bigger picture and uh because we brought them in to be part of the negotiations and, and that was kim's vision and also some of the other nations that you know that were that were, were coming in the treaty process that were we brought in some youth from from uh, Hue that came in and we had an open debate so that we didn't shy away from the the difficulties we we let people have their voice it was a, it wasn't like we were trying to to persuade them any way we wanted them to have the information and form their own opinions near the very end we as a treaty tri tri treaty team did say we believe in this we encourage you to vote yes but up until that it was 
anybody learn what you need to learn and make your vote. And um, and we did have some unfortunate uh, DVD videos too back in the day. Uh, I, I, I hope that those stay in the closet now, but uh, at the time they served their purpose because I just want to add one more one more thing is that the diversity in the, the, the materials that you provide because we have people that, um, that were uh, illiterate that would be able to read those materials. And we had to keep that in mind. We had people that were, you know, had access to technology and didn't. So we had to keep that in mind. So diversifying, the biggest communication uh, lesson that I learned was diversifying how we reach out to our members and let them tell us how, what, what is the best way that they like to, to learn and, and be a part of it. But um, Kim has always said, and I agree that uh, we have a lot of treaty experts in our community because we built that capacity, Hechka. And thanks, uh, Grace, for your, your sharing your story too, Hechka. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, a word of encouragement, not to forget about all that great work uh, that you've done in the past and don't forget to bring it forward and use it again because just because you've seen it once or twice or featured it for a couple of months doesn't mean it's not still relevant. And um, an example that I'll use is a, a video that the Treaty Commission prepared probably six years ago now, um, might be even longer because uh, some of your community members were in it. Grace talking about getting into treaty. Um, lots of Kitsilas, Kits and Kalem people were in it as well. Um, I showed it to a group I was presenting to and they weren't treaty nations. I was talking about becoming self-government and the tool we used was treaty to get there. But it was amazing how many people realized that when you're talking about self-government, this is just the tool to get there. I think, you know, it breaks down a lot of myths about treaty when you really talk about the, the results and the outcomes of being self-governing, because really that's what it's all about, certainly in my humble opinion. Um, Ashley, I see you nodding vigorously there, just seeing if you have anything that you wanted to add uh, following the presentation. I'll ask Coral and David as well. Ashley. Uh, I just, again, thank you to the modern treaty nations for really bridging that gap between uh, what's going on now and, and how we've been able to learn some lessons from your nation and and you, you've just been so open and candid and we couldn't thank you enough and uh, again you know it's really about that bigger picture and building the capacity of the people and it's so exciting to hear uh, how far the nations have come from prior to you know, ratification uh, to where they are now. So I just, it makes me really, really excited for Comox and, and all the other nations that are going through this. Thank you, Ashley. Coral, any comments? Yeah, thank you, Angela. Uh, I was just thinking, um, you know, through this process, uh, like in my previous role, really, uh, you know, the Indian Act, the, the reality is that the Indian Act and the determination of status, you know, has really become synonymous uh, with belonging within our communities. And it's it's a really unfortunate reality. And so I, I think there's so many things to celebrate throughout this process. Um, I mentioned, you know, earlier on, like, uh, if you don't have a membership code, this is the process of determining your people. And uh, you know, Comox's perspective was we've always known who our people are, um, you know, and it's our perspective that that has never sh it should have never been with the government to determine that. Um, and so there's so many things to celebrate throughout this process and really raise my hands up uh, to people like Kim uh, and Valerie and Grace, uh, who are also generous uh, in sharing their experience with eligibility and enrollment. Um, as I had mentioned, Comox, definitely we we wouldn't be in the place we are today without your support and your guidance and and your input. So raise my hands up to you, Emo Gaila Kessla. Thank you very much, Coral. And before we go to the, the open forum here, David, did you have any comments as one of the presenters on what you've heard? No, I didn't have any comments. It's very interesting. I'm grateful to be here. Okay, great. Thank you. So we've heard a lot. We've heard a lot about keeping this story alive. And uh, my friend Francis is madly texting me thinking back to all of the days when all of this started and uh, how much of a story there is to tell that it's not, you know, it's not just modern day treaties. All of us have got parents, grandparents, um, mentors, ancestors, people who've been involved in bringing us to where we're at today. And it's it's milestones that we're reaching here. And, and we've reached amazing or had amazing achievements uh, by First Nations over the years.